it's been a long time. Yes, it's been a long time, but we're back! Two steps to the left. The 19th Annual Memphis Blues Festival, Festival. Starring Willie Clayton. Now we're in the middle. From side to side. The Manhattans featuring now Gerald Alston. Let's kiss and say goodbye, pretty baby. That dancing Pokey Bear. Nelly Tiger Travis. J1. And the J. Morris Group. She said, I'm oh. The 19th Annual Memphis Blues Festival. Saturday, August 20th at the Lander Center. Willie Clayton. The man that is featuring Gerald Austin. Pokey Man. Nelly Tiger Travis. J. Warren. Saturday, August 20th at the Lander Center. Tickets on sale at the box office and Ticketmaster.com. Hey, hey, the blues is all right. You know, when you have a case in criminal court, you want to feel as though you're walking into a courtroom where the judge is fair. Just and has a knowledge of the law, and no matter what crime you are accused of, that that judge will treat you with respect and dignity. That's why you want to elect Sanjeev Maymula as Judge Criminal Court Division 8. Many citizens, as well as lawyers, have complained that the present judge in Division 8 does not know how to talk and treat those who come before him, but not so with Sanjeev. May Mula, Sanji is prepared to deal with all that come before him justly as he hands down the law fairly. Sanji has over 20 years experience as an assistant public defender in Memphis and Shelby County. He has defended clients of all different backgrounds. He has litigated cases all the way from arrest to jury trial involving crimes that range from misdemeanors to murder and rape. Sanjeev is committed to treating all litigants, witnesses, and victims of crime fairly and with compassion, and is dedicated to the cause of justice in Memphis and Shelby County. If you're ready for a change in Criminal Court Division 8, vote August 4th for Sanjeev Maymula as your criminal court judge in Division 8. Early voting starts July 15th through the 30th, paid for by the committee to elect Sanjeev Maymula Rajesh is the treasurer. Veronica Cooper wants to be elected as judge in General Sessions Court Division 5. Veronica Cooper got her law degree in 1997 from the Villanova University, did her undergraduate work at the Morris Brown College in 1994. Veronica Cooper has 25 years in private practice, admitted to the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth District. She's also a former college professor, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. She is also a member of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority. She is very diverse in this community, holding no prejudice and feel that everyone should be equal and treated with fair justice. She also says that Shelby County needs a judge who knows that her role is to serve the people by showing up to work working hard and treating those that come before her with respect and dignity. She says, I am that judge. She says, vote for her because she will show up and eliminate the current waste in General Sessions Division 5. She will value the citizens of Chevy County and work hard on their behalf and respect the bench and respect those who come before her. Early voting starts on July the 15th through the 30th. Election day is August the 4th. Vote for Veronica Cooper Judge, General Sessions Court, Division 5. Paid for by... 
the committee to elect Veronica R. Copeland Judge Ada Tootin is a treasurer. You know, in this election cycle, when it comes to electing judges, not only do you want honesty and integrity, but you want experience as well. And experience is exactly what you will get when you elect Stuart Breakstone Circuit Court Judge Division 6. Stuart Breakstone is a Shelby County native. He graduated from Germantown High School, earned his undergraduate MBA and law degrees from Memphis State University. Stuart Brinkstone began practicing law in 1991. He has broad experience in the courtroom. Stuart has tried over 50 civil jury trials and 300 bench trials in circuit, chancery, and juvenile court. He has argued more than 50 cases before the Tennessee Court of Appeals. Stewart has been a alternative resolution dispute mediator since 2013. He has spoken at dozens of seminars on topics such as evidence, contempt, and family law. Stewart is past president of the family law section of the Memphis Bar Association. When you considering the right candidate, judge by experience, vote Stuart Breakstone for Judge Circuit Court Division 6 on August the 4th. Early voting starts on July the 15th. Paid for by friends of Stuart Breakstone, Nick Ryan's treasurer. This is sad to get bad news. You know, it's not often that I can say that a candidate that is running for office is truly a good person and will do exactly what they say they will do if elected. But I can say that about Judge Lonnie Thompson, Judge General Sessions Court, the Vision Six. Lonnie Thompson and I shot marbles. We played kickball in the street. We lived next door to each other. We grew up in the same church. Lonnie Thompson is fair in his court, and I know he's fair because I've been in his court, and he recused himself because of our lifelong friendship. Lonnie Thompson deserves to be re-elected as your General Sessions Court Judge in Division 6. He has 23 years of experience as a judge. Trusted leadership and trusted experience is what you get in Judge Lonnie Thompson. So on August 4th, vote to re-elect Judge Lonnie Thompson, General Sessions Court Division 6. Early voting starts July 15th through the 30th. Paid for by the committee to elect Judge Lonnie Thompson. Judge Sheila Edwards is a treasurer. From being born in Finchford, raised in Whitehaven, graduating from Central High School, through 24 years of legal practice, I am an advocate for the community for justice and for equality. My name is Carlos Bibbs and I'm an experienced attorney seeking a judgeship in Circuit Court Division 2. Circuit Court deals with business issues, divorces, medical malpractice, and name changes just to list a few. It's important to have experienced advocates in our courtrooms from the council table to the bench. As your next Circuit Court judge, I will treat each litigant fairly and with respect from beginning to end. I ask each of you for your support and your vote, because together we can bring about justice and equality in our community. Education, experience, community involvement, special legislation, conferences and workshops, family, church, and friends. 
honesty, integrity, accessibility, what Barbara Cooper brings to you and me. She'll take a stand, together we can win again. Reelect Barbara Cooper, State Representative, District 86, paid for by friends of Barbara Cooper. When electing a judge, you want to make sure that that person has a knowledge of the law, has experience in the law, has has integrity and is known to be an honest person. And you will get all of these qualities if Teresa Hewitt is elected as the judge in General Sessions Criminal Court Division 11. She's represented many in the Shelby County area as their attorney. Now she wants to represent all Shelby Countyans. If elected, when you want in her courtroom, you will know you are about to be treated fairly. Your status or your culture will not determine your outcome. Only how you as a person can receive justice according to the law. On August 4th, vote for fairness on the bench. Vote Teresa Shooting, General Sessions Criminal Court Judge Division 11, paid for by the committee to elect Teresa Hewlett, Larry Williams, Treasurer. This is that is Matthews. You know, people are always asking me. Who do I feel is a great lawyer that can handle their criminal or their civil matters? And I always have to recommend my lawyer of over 25 years, Joe Osment. Now I want to recommend my friend and my lawyer, Joe Osment, for Criminal Court Judge Division 2. Joe Osment has been practicing law for 30 years. Joe Osment is a man of honor, a man of integrity, a man that if you, your family, or your friends have to stand in front of him, you know whether you're the victim or the defendant, the courtroom of Joe Osment is about justice and fairness for all. Joe Osment is committed to helping find solutions in the community and to making the right decisions in the courtroom regarding those that can be saved and those that should be incarcerated to save others. Vote Joe Osment, Criminal Court Judge Division 2. Early voting starts July 15th through the 30th. Election day is August 4th. Paid for by the committee to elect Joe Osment, Criminal Court Judge Division 2, Michael Working Treasurer. I've had the honor and the privilege to serve as your judge in Division 5 of General Sessions Civil Court for the past 16 years. I made history as the first elected female judge of the Shelby County General Sessions Civil Court. I dispose of thousands of cases making impartial and just decisions. I am proud to serve Shelby County. Thank you for your vote. Paid for by the committee to re-elect Judge Betty Thomas Moore, Alvin Moore, Treasurer. citizens of District 86. My name is Will Richardson and I'm asking to be your next state representative. I'm a husband, I'm a father, a grandfather, multiple business owner, decorated veteran, man of God, and I care about the people. Yes, we have our challenges within our city and our state. That's why I'm asking for your support to continue the legacy and the hard work of our district. I want to be your voice in Nashville to assist in lowering crime, bringing better education for our children, bringing quality and affordable health care, and jobs back to our city. Remember on August 4th to consider me 
Will Richardson as your next state representative for District 86. Remember, where there's a will, there's a way. And just when you thought it may be safe, it ain't. Good Tuesday evening to you. Welcome again to the most controversial show that is out here. Thank you for being here with me. Thank you for watching all of these commercials. That's how the pastor makes a living. Thank you, Jesus. Plus, you need to know on election day, who you need to vote for. I got a stack of um, t-shirts over here and this was the only one that was not wrinkled and I do want you to consider uh, Veronica Cooper. Also in that pay race brother is Betty Thomas. Thomas. I am not telling you in that race who to vote for. Betty Thomas has been a longtime friend. Veronica uh, Cooper, I've met her. She seems to be able to do the job, and I leave that up to you. Uh, Jerry Smith, I, ain't, I don't give a fuck tonight about what's going on in Chicago. That's not my subject matter. So you tune in to the TV and radio in Chicago, and they will tell you about what's going on in Chicago. If you can't stay on topic, I'm gonna fuck get you out the room. That's just the way it is. I've got a guest that I'm going to be calling in just a moment. And I want you to stick around for the end of the show after my guest. Um Larry, you gone. So you motherfuckers that won't talk about something else other than what I'm talking about. Please understand, I don't give a fuck. If it ain't about what I'm talking about, that's the only thing to me that is important. Okay? Uh, Larry, uh, yeah. Okay, that, that's it. That's all. That's all that I care about. Um, I'm also, the subject tonight is truth. Please, Angela, stay on the topic. Don't ask me about nothing. We ain't friends, y'all. I'm doing a talk show. I'm, I'm glad that you're concerned about some things, but let me do the show without you asking me a goddamn thing. Because I'm pissed tonight as well. And y'all stay around after my guests. Because I'm going to tell you, Memphis has the distinct, undistinct pleasure. I don't know what kind of pleasure it is of having the lionest motherfucker in the world in the city of Memphis. And you've been lying on me. And people have come to me today and told me the lies that you've been telling on me. And I'm going to deal with you on tonight and reveal exactly who you are, what you're doing, and the people that you're hoodwinking and bamboozling. But first of all, I want to deal with the fact that Memphis is a crime-ridden city. And many have talked about what can we do to eliminate the crime in the city. Power on. What can we do with individuals who Nothing continue to commit crimes? One of the things that I have been a proponent of is the factor in truth in 
sentencing. If you get 50 years, you do 50 years. If you get 25 years, you do the 25 years. If you have committed a uh, violent crime. So on the first, on Friday, the law went into effect where there would be truth in sentencing. So I thought that the person to best tell us about this new law would be Shelby County District Attorney Amy Wari. And the general did say that she would come on the air. And let me see if I can get the general on the phone. First time ever that I've had the pleasure of in interviewing the Attorney General of Shelby County. Now let me say this. My only topic with the DA is going to be truth in sentencing. Those of you who have an issue with the general, take it up with the general. But tonight, the only thing, the only subject on this program is going to be truth in sentencing. Everybody. Miss Warwick, good evening Hello. to you. How, how are, you, are you? How are you doing this evening? I'm good, and you? Good. I'm, it's been a long day and it's hot outside as well. Yes, sir. Thank you for agreeing to appear on my program. And as I have shared with my audience concerning you, that my only topic tonight is truth in sentencing. Uh, we're not going into any other areas. We're not going into a political campaign or anything of that nature. My concern is truth in sentencing. Now, one of my concerns has been for a number of years is the high rate of crime in the city of Memphis. And the factor that many criminals commit violent crimes and they've been able to plea their way out of their sentencing. They're given 20 years, they only do five years or three years of something of that nature and they rob they've carjacked, they have did all type of heinous crimes. And I've always said that we need a law where individuals who have committed these crimes do their whole turn, their whole bid, and maybe this would be a method that was used to deter crime in the city. Uh, Ms. Wyrick, will you explain exactly what the truth in sentencing new law is all about? Be happy to. It's something I've been fighting for for many, many years, and it means exactly what you just said. If someone is sentenced to prison to do a 10-year sentence for a violent crime, they are now going to do that 10 years. Before July 1st, before a very small fraction of that 10 years mm -hmm. and it's why there is and has been very little respect for the laws of the state of Tennessee 
And it's why there is and has been frustration on the part of victims. I've, I've been a prosecutor for 32 years. Mm -hmm. I have met, unfortunately, thousands of victims in my career. And many of them would not have suffered at the hands of the offender had truth in sentencing been in place before July 1st. But we have it now, and it is a great tool that the legislature has given us to start fighting violent crime. Now, let, let me also ask you this. What crimes, or do all crimes, or is it just violent crimes? It's not all crimes, but it's the crimes that matter. Okay. It's criminal attempt murder in the first degree. It's aggravated assault. It's aggravated burglary. And that's one that really um, we see, unfortunately, a lot of aggravated burglary. And aggravated burglary is breaking into someone's home mm -hmm. while they're not there and mm -hmm. stealing their hard-earned possessions, right? And if someone is brazen enough to break into your home while you are not there and steal from you, uh, if, if you've been the victim of an aggravated burglary, it's a it's a traumatizing event. So, and if someone is brazen enough to do that, it speaks volumes of their future violence. And so what was often frustrating for victims of ag burglary was that they would hear the judge sentence the person to three years at the penal farm. Okay. And then we had to explain to them, well, they're not really going to do three years. They're going to do about six months of that. So what, what is the difference in simple burglary and aggravated burglary? Simple burglary is if I break into, burglary of a motor vehicle is breaking into a car. Burglary of a building is breaking into a structure that is not, uh, not a home, not habitable. Okay. Aggravated burglary is breaking into a home. So you're saying now, and what is the sentence the, under the statute? What is the sentence for aggravated burglary? It ranges from three years to 15 years, depending on how lengthy your criminal record is. If okay. you have been committing crimes for a long time, then we move up that scale and the judges can sentence you to up to 15 years. So okay. the, the crimes that are now truth in sentencing crimes are those violent crimes that uh, that, that terrorize neighborhoods and traumatize families. And now okay. we have an opportunity to make sure those offenders do that complete sentence. If they get sent to prison, I think that's an important piece of this that needs to be part of the conversation. Okay. This is not, this is not mandatory incarceration. So we still as prosecutors have the discretion. Uh, and a lot of people have been concerned that, you know, 16 year olds that commit violent crime are they now going to be sent off for 30 40 years at 100 percent we still have discretion as prosecutors to use this in the most effective way and so if we have a situation that for some reason um you know we don't want to charge a truth and sentencing offense or if we're dealing with the juvenile and we want to look at other ways to handle the situation we can still do that. But for those offenders who continue to victimize um, and leave us no choice but to seek a prison sentence, then they are the ones that are now going to be doing all of the time instead of this funny math that has been the reality for far too long. Well, let's talk, let's talk about the juvenile. Does the juvenile that would fall under the truth in sentencing, would he have to be tried as an adult? Yes. For this to apply, yes, sir. Okay. So yeah. when we look at here in Memphis and we look at the number of 15, 16, and 17, and even in some cases, we've had some cases where the offender was 14 years of age you're robbing, you, you're carjacking, and you're doing all of these things. So how do we apply the being tried as an adult factor into these 
juvenile offenders. Right. The same way we do now. We look to the law and we look to the facts of the individual cases and we mm. look to the overall circumstances of the case and we look to whether or not this juvenile offender has been in the system before. In other words, have they been here before for other crimes and we have tried probation, we have tried rehabilitation, we have tried everything we have in our in our arsenal and mm -hmm. it's not working and they continue to victimize citizens or is this the first time that this juvenile has committed a crime and um you know hurt or harmed someone all of those factors uh play into every decision that we make but as with every decision we make pertaining to juveniles it is not anything that we take lightly and we look to the whole circumstance the entire case can we can we prove our case? Are our witnesses cooperative? Is the victim cooperative? Is this the right thing to do? So what makes your office decide that you're going to give a juvenile who has shot somebody, he's, he's committed capital murder, or he's committed even first degree or second degree murder, and he's been through the system. The gangs have used him because of his age to commit these crimes because the younger offender uh, seems to get off with a lesser punishment than, than the adult. What is going to make your office say, look, this guy may be 15 or 16 years old, but he's been a victim of, he will not have been a victim, but he's been a perpetrator in robberies before and things of that nature what is a point scale that has to be set for uh the juvenile which is where a lot of our crimes are coming from uh what is the point level or the scale level where you say this person uh this child or this minor is going to be tried as an adult well, it's a lot of different things. And so it, it's not a point scale because, you know, a, a machine could do it if it was a point scale. It takes that um, prosecutor analysis. It takes that discretion that prosecutors have to look at, again, the whole case. Um, and that, you know, that decision as it relates to a 15-year-old is going to be a totally different conversation as it relates to a 17-year-old. And here's why. If we don't seek transfer of juveniles who have killed, raped, and robbed, mm -hmm. and they are 17 years old, the maximum amount of time that they would do for that murder, for that rape, would be two years. At the age of 19, juvenile court no longer has jurisdiction over them, and they would then be released back into the community after two years on a first-degree murder with no supervision, no restrictions on their behavior, nothing, if we didn't seek transfer. And so that is, that is in, in many cases, the one of the, the most um, critical elements of the decision that, that we have to make. I wish we didn't have to make these decisions. I wish we didn't have so many 12, 13, 14-year-olds running around town armed with deadly weapons looking for victims. Um, but that's, you know, that that's a remedy that happens far upstream from me. That's a remedy that happens farther away from the DA's office. Um, and long before a case lands on our desk and I've got a grieving family in my office. So are, are you saying to me, Ms. Ward, that when we deal with the juvenile offender, we're still in the same place that we've been all the time. What do you mean? Well, if you can't prosecute him, and if the juvenile understands that if he's 17 years old, at 19 he's gone, where is the deterrence not to commit a crime? Right. Right. And so that's, you know, that, that's one of the reasons we have to make those tough decisions to seek the transfer, because if we didn't, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. In less than two years time, this individual would be back out on the streets with no supervision, no restrictions at all. If we didn't seek the transfer, the transfer oftentimes gives us a little more time to perhaps um, pursue rehabilitative efforts or to pursue a lengthier uh, probation period or things like that. But we can never, ever, ever forget the victims in all of this. And remember that every one of these cases that we're talking about juveniles being transferred, there is a victim's family or a victim who has been forever impacted by this crime. Um, there were 40 juveniles that were transferred last year by juvenile court. The majority of those were 17 to 18 years old. One of those was a 40 year old man. He had committed a crime as a juvenile that went unsolved all of these years. Mm -hmm. It was finally solved. It was a rape case, finally solved. And the law allows him to go back to juvenile court and have a transfer hearing. So, you know, every case is different. We have to look at the totality of the circumstances. We have to look to both um, the situation with the offender and also the situation with the victim and with the witnesses and with the strength of our case and what is the right thing to do. One of the things I think that needs to be understood, General, is the factor that everybody wants the DA's office to do something about this, that, or the other. But am I correct in saying that you can only do what the state legislators allow you on the statutes to do? That you just can't make a, a difference. You, get, you just can't make a decision, rather, on what you're going to do outside of the statutes that the state legislators have put in place. Sure. You know, people get, it, it's a, it's a daily conversation that I have that people are frustrated with um, some result that has happened in the courts. And what is usually the answer there is we are hamstrung bound, however you want to look at it, by the laws of the state and you know that's a good kind of circle back to the whole truth and sentencing most of the time what we deal with are victims and members of the community that are frustrated that people are going to prison and then it seems like the prison system is just running them out the back door too fast um, this truth and sentencing legislation is going to shut that back door of the prison system it's going to help us stop the bleeding and it's going to then allow us the time and the opportunities to get a handle on violent crime. But first things first, we have to make sure that those that have committed violent crime who have been sent to prison are doing the time that the legislature deemed their crime deserved. Okay. Well, we know, and I'm looking at some of the comments from some of my viewers, is that it's the teenager that is basically doing the terrorizing in the city. Will we see from the DA's office seeking more transfers of these juveniles into uh, the adult situation? I hope not. I hope not. But that, that decision... You know, I can't make a promise to the community, and I never will, that mm -hmm. I'm only going to ask for transfer on X number of cases. Okay. Because what do I say to the family member who comes in on the next case? I'm okay. sorry, we've already transferred too many juveniles this year. I can't help you with the murder of your loved one. That The answer to that question falls upon the shoulders of the juveniles and the communities long before the case ever gets to me. I hope we don't have to seek transfer on as many juveniles as we did last year, because if we don't, that means that there's less violent crime being committed by juveniles. What's an approximate number of juveniles that were transferred last year? There's nothing approximate about it. It's 40. Okay. Okay. So you transferred 40 juveniles last year into the, juvenile, the juvenile court 
Judge mm -hmm. granted our motion to transfer on 40 juveniles. Okay. We sought transfer on more than that, okay. and those were denied by the court. And that's, you know, that's how the system works. We file uh -huh. a motion. We put our proof on. The defense attorney puts their proof on, and the judge makes the decision. At, there were 40 at, juveniles that were transferred. At, 32 of those 40 cases involved deadly weapons. 29 of those 32 were guns, guns in which the trigger was pulled, guns in which the gun was used to uh, beat a victim with or terrorize a victim with. So are, are, are we at a point now where we use the law and, and thank God for this new law, we use it as it is. Will your office do the promotion? Because, you know, a lot of these crooks out here and criminals don't even know that the new law took place on July 1. Will there be marketing from your office that will go out into this community telling them that if you do this, this is what is going to happen to you? Yes, we've been, we've been pushing some things out for the last month. We pushed something out on Friday. I'll make sure it gets sent to you so that you can share it. And, you know, having conversations like this are mm -hmm. important so that uh, word does get out. Because, again, as I said, I hope we don't have to make these decisions on juveniles. I hope somewhere down the road somebody thinks twice well, I think about I going think, out tonight with a gun and looking for victims. Well, I think this is going to be a long road <laughs> if, we look yeah. at, if we look at what is happening in Memphis right now. Now, let me also ask you this. Will the persons who committed crimes prior to July 1, will they come under this new law? No, no, it's only for crimes committed after July 1. Okay, so persons who committed crimes prior to July 1, they're still eligible for pleas. Well, sure, everybody will still be eligible for pleas, but yes, anybody... Um, any crime committed before July 1 will have the benefit of the uh, non-100% the non percentage okay. of okay. their sentence. The, the, you know, the 30% or the 35%, the, the, the confusing, the, the math, the tricky math. So when, when the sentencing comes down or it, your office, the prosecutor's office, makes a recommendation to the judge for sentencing. But the judge, if I'm correct, has the discretion. Yes, sir. As to whether he's going to follow your recommendation or not. Yes. And we have to be able to back up our recommendation. Okay. So if we recommend that somebody be sentenced to the high end of a range, we have to be able to prove to the court why that should be. We have to show that they have prior convictions for violent behavior. We have to show, you know, there's there's statutory um, elements that we have to establish in court to back up our request that they be sentenced at that higher range. And if we don't have those statutory requirements, we're never going to, we're never going to make that request of the judge. But yes, at the end of the day, it's up to the judge to, to listen to our proof, to listen to the defense attorney's uh, proof, on the other side of the conversation and then for the judge to make that decision. When we look at the high amount of road rage that takes place in the city, will the, after, as of now, those persons who commit murders and things of that nature on the highway, do they need to know that they can be sentenced to the, to the max and what is going to be the recommendation of a person that just rides along and shoots into somebody's car and takes their life? Is that is it road rage or is it considered a uh, first or second degree murder? Sure. If you if you shooting into a car or occupied with people, that you've just graduated from road rage into okay. more more than likely a murder one or a murder two. Again, that depends on the facts that the police can gather, the evidence that the police can get their arms around, and the case that the police can bring to us to prosecute. Okay. Um, 
vehicular homicide is now a 100% offense. Um, so, you know, if you are driving recklessly, if you are driving under the influence of intoxicants and you kill someone, mm -hmm. you're now doing that whole sentence. Okay. Um, but certainly, yes, shooting into a car uh, is certainly more than just road rage or drag racing or things like that. But it, it depends on the facts and it depends on what, what we can establish. So, and you mentioned drag racing. Drag racing has become very prominent in this community. And at some point, and I hope it does not happen, but at some point with the law not having prosecuted many, I don't believe, for the drag racing, somebody's going to get hurt. What, yep. what is your message from the DA's office to the drag racer if he causes damage or the life of another individual? Sure. So drag racing that results in the death of someone uh, could very easily be charged as a felony, a reckless homicide, a criminally negligent homicide, mm -hmm. or depending again on the facts and circumstances, maybe a murder in the second degree. So um, this, while drag racing is a misdemeanor the consequences of it and the danger to not only the driver but innocent people on the road mm -hmm. um, should be enough to deter people from continuing to engage in it um, and you know keep in mind the police department has done an amazing job of late of really um, looking for these cases making these arrests bringing us cases to prosecute and the drag racing statute allows us, if you're convicted of drag racing, to seize your car. To take that very expensive car that you love and cherish and have uh -huh. worked so hard on, the law allows us to take it from you. Okay, okay. That's that's the same way with uh, drugs as well, isn't it? Yep, yep, same thing. Okay. So... When, when we look into these cases, and sometimes the, the general public says that the DA's office is lax on certain crimes in the black community. What do you have to say to that, General? Is lax on crimes in the African American yeah, community? Yeah, yeah. even though that's where basically 90% You'll, you'll get a segment of the black community that says, well, the DA's office is not doing this. My brother got killed. My mama got gotcha. killed. Gotcha. So uh, uh, one thing I will say across the board, um, I believe there are many situations in which, which the system is not tough enough. It's not that the DA's office is not tough enough. You've got 110 of the finest prosecutors anywhere in the world working every day in your DA's office fighting for justice and fighting for victims. But oftentimes, 99% of the time, when people are frustrated with the result of their case, it is a shortcoming in the law. Um, and again, we hope this truth in sentencing will help remedy some of that. But the other fight that we have every day mm -hmm. is witnesses and victims not showing up to testify. I can't go into court and tell a judge this is what these pe fine people would tell you if they had bothered to show up. Okay. Um, if I've got nobody to come forward and testify about what they saw or heard, then prosecutors are scrambling every day to try to get something out of a case when they are often left holding a, an empty bag. That's why the, the program that Dr. Atkins, uh, Bill Atkins at mm -hmm. Greater Romani helped start the 901 RAP program, mm -hmm. which is witness relocation he gave us he gave the crime commission some money to get the program started the county commission responded with one hundred and fifty thousand dollars and now on the scene of crimes we've trained all the memphis police department and the shelby county sheriff's office if they've got victims or witnesses that need to be moved right then and there we're making those decisions at, at two o'clock in the morning if okay. need be to get them to a safe place for the night and then to make uh, more uh, long-term decisions about housing to keep them safe 
and to make sure that they feel confident coming to court and testifying. So, and, and one of my viewers uh, that I know is asking, are these laws balanced or do they just target black people? Will white criminals suffer the very same consequences? Of course. Of course. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's always, always, always the job and the mission of our office to do the right thing every day for the right reason. Uh, there's, you know, very good reason that Lady Liberty is is blindfolded. Okay. Uh, nobody, nobody's above the law and nobody's beneath the protections of the law. And we fight hard for that every day. But no. again, you know, it's, uh -huh. we can only do, we react when the police react. The police react when the community reacts. And it all starts with somebody in the community picking up the phone and calling law enforcement and saying, I saw something, I heard something, I know something. And then it takes law enforcement to do their job, to investigate a case, to bring us evidence, to make an arrest, to charge somebody. And then we pick up from there and do our job prosecuting. Let, let, let me ask you something, General. Your opposition in this in this race is saying what he can do to help the black community if he's elected. I mean, is there any more that anyone in the office can do other than what the law says? Of course not. We are bound by the law. I think what um, one of the things I'm most proud of, though, is not only the great work that our office does every day in the courts, handling cases, handling thousands of cases, trials, motions, all of those things, but the programs that we've built in the community. Um, the Fraser community was the first place that I put a community prosecutor, taking a senior prosecutor, putting them in the precinct, working side by side with law enforcement, getting to know the people in that community and the unique needs. And now we've got uh, the same model in the Tillman precinct and the Mount Moriah precinct. Mm. I wish I had the resources to put one in every precinct, but we're, we're doing the best we can with what we have. Restorative justice is another example of a program that we built um, to handle low level cases in the community where that crime occurred. And they are decided by members of the community who live Mm -hmm. where that crime occurred well, um but again it takes it takes all of that well you know i become leery and i've been doing this thing a long time joan uh i become leery of a politician and especially the white politician that comes to the black community and says that i'm going to do this for black folk okay and a lot of people in the black community will fall for that, not understanding that the DA's office cannot circumvent nor create its own level of laws that the state legislator has already designated this law. We may not agree with it, but the state legislator, until you change the legislators, uh, this is what the law is. So when we hear this, are we hearing political hype? Or uh, are, are we hearing uh, something that is not totally true because whoever sits in the DA's office must abide and follow by the laws that are set up by the state legislators? I think you're listening to dangerous talk. Yes, okay. because what you don't, want is a district attorney who is pushing some personal political agenda. Mm. Every decision I make as district attorney is based upon what the law says, based upon what the facts and the evidence tell us, and based upon what what is the right thing to do in this situation. Um, th that doesn't mean that we send everybody to prison. There but there needs to be an accountability when someone has broken the laws. How we hold people accountable is as varied and diverse 
as the cases that come before us. A small segment of these offenders end up in prison. For everybody else, they are going to be in the community with us, and we want them to succeed. Every case we touch, every case we decide to go forward and prosecute on, uh, that's all we want is for that individual to never come back to the system. But there's a whole host of cases every day that we look at it and we say, the right thing to do here is to dismiss these charges. Either the wrong person was arrested or there's problems with the case. Uh, there's problems with the search. There's issues that we have. There's a multitude of factors that go into every decision we make, but not one of them is politically motivated or partisan driven. Well, you know, in, in Sheppard County, you can go get a warrant for almost anything. The the warrant doesn't is not approved by your office. You have magistrates and things of that nature. The police present stuff to some of these magistrates and they say in Memphis in Shepherd County you can get a warrant for a bologna sandwich. Uh and I think that that is something that the public needs to understand. Where does your discretion come to prosecute a case? Either one of two places. Either the police, as you just articulated, they go and they get a warrant or they make an arrest out in the scene and they bring someone to 201 Poplar and a judicial commissioner, not anyone connected to our office, mm -hmm. says that, yes, there's probable cause here to charge this person with that crime. And then the next day when we get to court, we're going to have that case on our desk and we're going to look at it and we are going to use our discretion to decide what the next step should be. If this is something that needs to be dismissed, we're going to dismiss it right then and there and get it out of the system. If it's something that perhaps we need to do a little more investigation on, we're going to call the victim. We're going to look for some more information. We're going to talk to the officer and make some decisions. So that's one way. The other way is if police are called to a murder tonight mm -hmm. and they start gathering evidence on the scene, the, the agreement that we have with the police department and we have for many, many years is they don't charge anyone with uh, murder and, and a few other major violent crimes until and unless they've run it by a prosecutor and until and unless that prosecutor has answered this very important question. Given what we are presented by law enforcement right now, can we prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt mm -hmm. to a jury? That is our standard with everything that we do. Mm -hmm. Can we prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt, the highest standard to a criminal court jury? And if there's not enough evidence right now to answer that question in the affirmative, then we tell law enforcement, we're not approving these charges and you need to go do some more investigation. Okay. When, when we look at the truth in sentencing, how much time do you have, General? I got like two more minutes, buddy. Okay. When we look at truth in sentencing and we look at the bails the bonds that are being set. Um, does the bond recommendation come from you, or does no. it, it comes nope. from it comes from the judge? Which comes from the judicial commissioners. Judicial commissioners set the bond. They use an assessment tool called the public safety assessment tool. They work with pretrial services, and depending upon what that matrix and that assessment tool tells them. They then land on a bond that they believe is sufficient to protect the public mm -hmm. and to hopefully make sure that this offender comes back to court so this case can be handled in the system. But no, we are not involved in the setting or the determining of bail. Now, if we get to court tomorrow morning and we see that a judge has set a certain bond on a case and we happen to have information about that offender that might not have been available to the magistrate, like... Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they got a bunch of cases that they're wanted on out of California, or mm -hmm. we've got cases in grand jury that we're preparing to submit for indictment, things like that. Then we will make a general sessions judge aware of those uh, additional facts. And the judge then makes a determination whether or not to raise that bond, leave it the same, or in some situations, lower it. Okay. 
Well, General, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Well, Hope this was helpful. Is 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 there anything uh, that you want to say on the end? No, just appreciate you letting me come on and, and talk about this very important issue. And um, it's one of the best tools, if not the best tool, that we as prosecutors have been given to fight violent crime. And our office is standing ready to do that. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our guest Take has care. been been District Attorney General uh, Amy Warwick uh, the first time ever on my show uh, and I want to thank the general and I know some of you were trying to say some things and all the things other than what I'm talking about and uh, it it don't fly on on my show I appreciate the general coming on the show you know and I'm sure there were some people in the office that don't go on the Thaddeus Matthews show uh, many of you support uh, Steve Moroy I don't okay I do not support him uh, and let me say this neither have bought any time on this show so I ain't got Nothing. If if the general decides to buy some, I'll take it. Okay, and don't give a damn what you think. Uh, but I'm leery of any white candidate that comes and talk about what he's going to do for the black community. What can Steve Moroy do for the black community other than follow the law? A lot of things that you hear and will hear politicians say is nothing but political hype. I'm going to do this for the black people. Well, where you been all the time, Steve Moroy? doing anything for the black peoples. Why do we now that you want to be the district attorney general, why we want, uh, why you want to do something for the good colors now? And I look at a lot of these Negroes who are joining up with Steve Mora. First of all, I care less about a democratic party. I am not a Democrat. I am not a Republican. I'm a Thaddeus. I got my own mind to think and to research and to see what have you done for black folk already, Steve? Why all of a sudden you want to do something for the good black people? Okay. What is done? So I'm supporting as of right now you get mad, you can kiss my ass to shit, push you back. I'm supporting the general. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm supporting the general. And I'll get some folks that'll have your negative things. Fuck you. I don't care what you have to say. I I, I really don't. I, I, I don't care. What did he do on the city council? Somebody said... He did some on the city council. What did he do? She must dismiss your DV case. Motherfucker, I ain't got no DV case. Okay. And guess what? You ain't on the page no more. And hell, if she had dismissed it, which she can't, only a judge dumb motherfucker can dismiss it. Wouldn't that be reason for me to support her? If she dismissed my shit? Yes. You so stupid motherfuckers. So I'm asking my audience to support Amy Warren. Hmm. See, give me a reason to support Steve Moroy. You got a reason? 
fuck Steve Monroy? I called that motherfucker some months ago to, to talk to him. Motherfucker wouldn't return my call. Left me a little uh, message on the messenger. I'm not interested. So fuck you. I ain't interested in you either, Steve Monroy. And I hope that a large percentage of my audience said fuck you too. Now, let me tell y'all about the line this motherfucker that God allows to still breathe. In fact, Let me call the lion, motherfucker. Yeah, let me call the lion, motherfucker. I'm sorry, but the person you called has a voice mailbox that has not been set up yet. Goodbye. Well, let me call your other number. Do I have another number for you? Well, that's why you use the answer. You know, there are two things you can't That's my wife and my money. Before I lie on you or lie to you, I ain't gonna say nothing. Money makes you endorse anybody? Linda Morris, you motherfucking right, bitch. You poor bitch. I'd endorse your ugly ass mammy if she got some money. But Amy Warwick ain't did shit to me. What y'all mad at Amy for? Linda Norris, you can suck my asshole. Get your throat full of shit tonight if you want to, bitch. I didn't ask you to come on the goddamn page. No way. But let me tell you about this lying motherfucker. I have had three people today who bought time. I'm going to be a commercial making motherfucker in the next couple of days. Brent Thompson, you ain't shit. Your dead mammy ain't shit. Man, I had three judicial candidates today. that told me they would have came to me months ago. But you blocked them from getting to me. Then you lied to them about what my fee was. You told 
three judicial candidates. One told me that you said that at the beginning of the year, or oh, you don't want to do business with him, he going to charge you $5,000. But get ignorant motherfucker. You asking folk for $14,000. For what? One judicial candidate said that she kept trying to get a contract from you as to what $14,000 was going to cover. And finally quit fucking with you. Because she found out that you're a fast-talking, lying, black motherfucker. Let me let me let me share something to you. The reason I got about fourteen different candidates, judicial and otherwise, is because I got the largest numbers in this town of doing what I do. I've been doing what I do forty two years. And I don't need a sissy motherfucker like you, a dick sucking sissy motherfucker like you getting all up in my business. I told some judges who are now with me that you tried to keep from coming to me that here you are a disbarred lawyer. You did two turns in prison. You got you were a state legislator they put your ass out to state legislature. You stole some money from the elderly accounts of the old people. And you sorry, motherfucker, you want to come at me? See, the only time you can make a living, motherfucker, is during political season, and you find these dumb ass politicians that want to be elected so badly that they come onto your punk ass. You told politicians that you could get them in black churches. I told them all you need to do is call the pastor or the secretary. Tell them you got a check Sunday morning. You coming to worship with them and you got a check that you would like to give. Every black preacher that I know going to tell your ass, yes, sir, you can come on. They may not let you say nothing, but they're going to point you out and say such and such is here. Da, 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 da is here. That's all you wanted in a way. Gerard Mohammed suck my ass man you don't tell me who to talk about you go on brother you are disbarred man why would a politician trust you why would a politician pay you 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. You ask this particular candidate and she ain't got no reason to lie on you. You ask them for $14,000 to do what? You have no platform. Man, you ain't shit. You ain't from shit. And that other little punk that runs with you, Aaron, you motherfuckers gonna block my money? Tell all these politicians.
politicians. How you call me every day to tell me their business. That's the only reason I talk to your punk ass. Cause you talk like a bitch. Yeah. Tell Wanda Howard you were part of the scheme in January with some other folk that wanted to come against her. She's my guest tomorrow night. And you're going to find out this tag shit is politics. Tell Wanda. And I call Wanda. I said, don't trust that motherfucker. That motherfucker told me in January that certain Democrats, Regina Newman, Lee Harris, and some other leading Democrats who were mad at her because she was asking questions about where the money is. How come Regina Newman is sweeping her account every night. You were asking the wrong questions, Wanda. So when you start asking the wrong questions, and you got folk in city and county government that's stealing, been stealing, and they all in cahoots on the stealing together, they plotted at the end of last year to start a media blitz and trying to say that Wonder Howard is inefficient in her job. They don't want the questions. They don't want to tell you that Lee Harris stopped the mailing of tags from his office. They didn't want her to tell that many of you that buy your tags online you pay for the postage online, but you didn't get your tags because they wouldn't mail out. But that punk ass Brent Thompson knew it. He told me about it. And as soon as he told me the plan, I called Wanda. Wanda and I have been friends for years. So you vote for wonder. Don't let sissies, homosexuals, dick suckers, dick in the ass motherfuckers like Brent Thompson a lying, ugly motherfucker. Don't let a motherfucker like him destroy people who are trying to make the difference for black folk in this community. He talked out of both sides of his mouth. But Thompson, I just tried to call you. If I'm lying on your ass, or you know right now I'm talking about your bitch ass, you know my number. Call me and tell me I'm lying. Sabrina Shaw, what the fuck you know? They get you token ass niggas. These niggas, they give you niggas uh, 50 cents more than you've been making 
and you will lie and try to destroy somebody black in office. So, Michelle, if you got some shit and you know it, bitch, call me. If you can back up what you say, 901-231-9239. Or shut the fuck up. Paula Jordan, what you talking about? They buy niggas cheap now. Don't you think if they thought they could buy me, they would? They know I'm going to tell it. I ain't hungry and I ain't broke. That my number is. Anything that I said is wrong. Down me. 901. 231-9239. These people that you see advertising with me. Support them. Yeah, Thompson did some jail time. He about to do it again. He got arrested. Taj, if you if you are watching the night. Pull this record and send it to me. See, Lee Harris came on and asked about postage. I saw the news last week. They never asked that office for postage in the past. Can't buy me. I'm not for sale. No, you going to text me. No. You call me later this evening dealing with these Democrats. No, motherfucker. Don't tell me you, you dealing with no Democrats. What's going on, my guy? What you lying? Why are you out here lying on me, Brent Thompson? <laughs> Just BT, man. I thought it was your friend. Look, real no, quick. You ain't, you no, 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 no. You ain't my friend. You ain't. Ain't she. No, 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 no. Slow, 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 slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Slow down. You are lying. You are lying, motherfucker. And, and let me tell wait, you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Unbelievable. Yeah. You are lying, if motherfucker. Other, if these people you would been, just you believe. Been, you, are you feeling me? You just never, believe never, that it can happen. I think you'd have had Carlos almost seven months. Look, let, let me tell you something. You always want to talk fast, motherfucker. <laughs> what's okay. What's, yeah, what's what you got now? Okay. You are what's, lying. What's you ain't calling me in a while, man. We let Steins calls on us. The what? Yeah, Steins is closed permanently. Man, ain't nobody talking about no goddamn Steins. I'm talking about you anyway, being a what you got? Go ahead, what you got? Talk, what you got? I'm talking to you about being a lying motherfucker. And fucking with my money. Hold on. Hold on. What, what is the allegation? No, ain't no goddamn allegation. I talk what about, about, about What am I lying about? About my fees. You block politicians from coming to me. They no, told me that. that is. Yes, you that is. I brought. Hold man, on. Man, man. You ain't hold shit. On. Hold on. You, no, no, no. Stay, stay with me. Man, man. And you know, man. no, 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 no. All that. No, do, do this for me. You know I've never done that. Yes, you have. I've said more, yes, I've said more have. people to you than anybody. Yes, you did. You okay, fuck, and, and you for the various reason with that I just enumerated. Me. I just picked up new people, and you know that you can call them that. So, and I'm going to tell you what Patrice told me Saturday. She said, you better get all of them on there. So all of them got the money. I ain't going to sit here and lie to you and man, tell you folk ain't got money. You are, all, these you folk, are all these folk got money. You Come psychotic. On now. This motherfucker right here is a psychotic motherfucker. You ain't shit, Brent. You a lying anyway, motherfucker. Daddy, I anybody sent you a that fuck with okay? you 
ain't shit. And I don't, I don't ask, and I appreciate everything you sent me through that. Okay? We work it together. Just we, to keep it. We ain't working no motherfuckers look, together. I, I'm trying to I ain't get, send like, nobody get to you, motherfucker. One of my mail out pieces done for tomorrow I'm down here at FX. But um, Man. I promise you. No, no, I promise you. And I'm spreading it around. I heart with Dewan Hendricks. I do stuff with Tawana. I got people working. We got to get everybody out to keep the turnout because we man, just got to man. let the Democratic Party and it doesn't look... That motherfucker's weak as wall. That motherfucker's psychotic. And any of you politicians that I find out is dealing with this motherfucker... I'm going to fuck your campaign up. I'm going to talk about your crooked ass. A fast talking motherfucker. Motherfucker going to tell me Steen's clothes. Like the fuck, what the fuck I care? That Steen's is clothes. He ain't shit. Any of you politicians that deal with him, you're crazy. I'm going to put your criminal record up on the Facebook. No, that was not B.T. Austin. That was Brent Thompson. He, he may need, need to go see B.T. at his place of business. He's a nut. He meeting with the Democrats. That's the reason the Democratic Party is such a, a sorry as party. Cause you got motherfuckers like him in it. Bet his booty hole itching now. Cause somebody done call him. Why the fuck you answer the goddamn phone? He's a nut. He's psychotic. Ooh. Let me take care of some commercials. I ain't gonna do but a few of them. And then I'll be on back. Let me put my headphones on. So I can hear. Lord to mercy, Lord to mercy, Lord to mercy, a uh, ignorant son of a bitch. He must have been sucking the wrong kind of dick or something. The dick he been sucking ain't regular old dick. Shit. Woo. He must have had some of that Hispanic dick or something. I don't know. Ugh. We'll be back. Here's your to Melanie, Mrs. Cussing Pastor, 47th birthday party in Blue Show. It's Friday, September 9th, 7 p.m. at the La Place Ballroom and Event Center, 5841 Sycamore View in Summer, right behind Church's Chicken, featuring in concert L.J. Eccles. Do you want me to get it? O.B. Buchanan Summer Wolf If you want me Summer Wolf Leave me West Love I love the way you put it on me Mr. Sam Jump up, roll 
Red Velvet. I wanna love somebody. And introducing new like Southern Soul sensation, West Dawn. If you don't wanna treat me right, somebody else will. It's Melanie, Mrs. Cussing Pastor's 47th birthday party and blues show. Friday, September 9th at the La Place Ballroom and Event Center. Tickets are $40 in advance, $50 at the door. VIP, $65 per seat at a table of nine or a whole table for $500. Tickets available only at CussingPastor.com. The MC for the evening, none other than the Cussing Pastor, Thaddeus Matthews. Get your tickets now. Get on board the Cussing Pastor Blues Cruise, November 10th through November 14th. The cruise will leave sunny most every facet of the law. David Poole presently serves as a Shelby County General Sessions Criminal Court Judicial Commissioner or Magistrate for the past six years. He handles such matters as arrangements Warrant reviews, seizure hearings, warrant reviews, order of protections, and much, much more. David Poole, if elected, will make sure all matters in his courtroom are addressed with a sense of justice and fairness. On August 4th, vote David Poole, Criminal Court Judge Division 6. Early voting starts. July 15th through the 30th, paid for by Pool for Judge William Davis, Treasurer. It's been a long time. Yes, it's been a long time, but we're back! Two steps to the, the 19th Annual Memphis Blues Festival, starring Willie Clayton. Now we're in the middle. From side to side. The Manhattans featuring Not Gerald Austin. Let's kiss and say goodbye, pretty baby. That dancing Pokey Bear. Be there, oh, to be with my side piece. Nelly oh, Tiger oh, Travis. J1. I got the record. And the Jay Morris group. She said I'm be there. The 19th Annual Memphis Blues Festival, Saturday, August 20th at the Lander Center. Willie Clayton, the Manhattans featuring Gerald Alston, Pokey Bear, Nelly Tiger, Travis, Jay Wong, and Jay Morris Group. Saturday, August 20th at the Lander Center. Tickets on sale at the box office and Ticketmaster.com. Hey, hey, the blues is all right. Hello, I'm Judge Betty Thomas Moore. I have had the honor and the privilege to serve as your judge in Division 5 of General Sessions Civil Court for the past 16 years. I made history as the first elected female judge of the Shelby County General Sessions Civil Court. I dispose of thousands of cases making impartial and just decisions. I am proud to serve Shelby County. Thank you for your vote. Paid for by the committee to re-elect Judge Betty Thomas Moore, Alvin Moore, Treasurer. You know, when you have a case in criminal court, you want to feel as though you're walking into a courtroom where the judge is fair, just and has a knowledge of the law. And no matter what crime you are accused of, that that judge will treat you with respect and dignity. That's why you want to elect Sanjeev Maymula as Judge Criminal Court Division 8. Many citizens, as well as lawyers, have complained that the present judge in Division 8 does not know how to talk and treat those who come before him. But not so with Sanjeev Maymula. Sanjeev is prepared to deal with all that come before him justly as he hands down the law fairly. Sanjeev has over 20 years experience as an assistant public defender in Memphis and Shelby County. He has defended clients of all different backgrounds. He has litigated cases all the way from arrest to jury trial involving crimes that range from misdemeanors to murder and rape. Sanjeev is committed to treating all litigants 
witnesses and victims of crime fairly and with compassion and is dedicated to the cause of justice in Memphis and Chevy County. If you're ready for a change in criminal court, Division 8, vote August 4th for Sanjeev Maymula as your criminal court judge in Division 8. Early voting starts July 15th through the 30th, paid for by the committee to elect Sanjeev Maymula Rajesh is a treasurer. Greetings, citizens of District 86. My name is Will Richardson, and I'm asking to be your next state representative. I'm a husband, I'm a father, grandfather, multiple business owner, decorated veteran, man of God, and I care about the people. Yes, we have our challenges within our city, in our state. That's why I'm asking for your support to continue the legacy and the hard work of our district. I want to be your voice in Nashville to assist in lowering crime, bringing better education for our children, bringing quality and affordable health care, and jobs back to our city. Remember on August 4th to consider me, Will Richardson, as your next state representative for District 86. Remember, where there's a will, there's a way. From being born in Finchford, raised in Whitehaven, graduating from Central High School, and 24 years of legal practice, I am an advocate for the community, for justice, and for equality. My name is Carlos Bibbs, and I'm an experienced attorney seeking a judgeship in Circuit Court, Division Two. Circuit Court deals with business issues, divorces, medical malpractice, and name changes, just to list a few. It's important to have experienced advocates in our courtrooms, from the council table to the bench. As your next Circuit Court judge, I will treat each litigant fairly and with respect from beginning to end. I ask each of you for your support and your vote, because together we can bring about justice and equality in our community. All right, we are back. Uh, my guest tomorrow night will be Wanda Halbert, Chevy County Court Clerk Wanda Halbert will be my guest on tomorrow. I've got some commercials uh, to make tomorrow. I got meeting with three people tomorrow. Get my checks. <laughs> Get my checks, get my checks, get my checks. And uh, I picked up one of those, a check today from uh, Danny Kale. I will be supporting Danny Kale for judge of the environmental court. Uh, I think it's very important when we look around our city we see all of the blight in the city and the present judge and i know him uh, his brother is my neighbor but the facts are when we look around our community and we look at like what mary murphy had to do in walker homes marvis rogers had to do in the Frasier area, it's time to have a judge in the environmental court that is going to make a difference. I'm going to start the commercial off with pictures of the street that I grew up on in New Chicago, Clyde Street. All of the houses are gone except the house that I was raised in. But it's been gutted. Tires are all in front of the house. I've called city council people. I've called county commission. And nothing has been done. 
You've got blight in your communities. You've got houses in your community that's been vacant for years. And nothing has happened. It's time to make a difference. And that difference will be made with Danny Kale. I'm supporting Danny. His will be the first commercial that I work on tomorrow in between my schedule. But we need to make a difference. And, and I'm going starting on the 15th. I'm adding a one hour show to what I do. I'm going to do 9 to 10 from 6 on to 10 on the radio. Uh, and then I'm going to do a show from 12 on to 1 o'clock, which will deal with going out to vote. It is very important that you go to vote. Very important that you go to vote. These judicial races are races that you need to be concerned about. You want to go before fair judges, judges that know how to treat you with dignity. And I've got, like I said, I've got two judges to meet with on tomorrow. I'm also meeting with a representative of Tariq Sugarman. We'll see how that goes as well. Right now, I've reduced my price all the way down to $2,500. What does the $2,500 do? It gets me pushing you as a candidate. It gets you on my midday show, my evening show. And this $2,500 will last you all the way until election day. But it's time to go vote. State legislator, I am endorsing Will Richardson. And let me tell you, Barbara Cooper, I consider her a friend Barbara has been there and answered questions and dealt with issues for me, personal issues and issues of other people in the community. But Barbara is 93 years of age. I think that Will Richardson, who has been constantly out on the campaign trail. In fact, Will and I have become good friends. His wife and and my wife, we've had two dinners. We've had dinners the last two weekends. Not even talking about politics. He's also in the home health business. He ain't broke. He's got agencies all over the state of Mississippi, all over the state of Tennessee, Iowa, Places of that nature. He owns his home, own health care uh, service. You know where they send them people in to take care of you when you're sick and things of that nature. Uh, let me tell you something. $2,500, you can't get it nowhere. And I ain't going to step lower. I went from $3,500. That's what I was charging, not $5,000. If there were some more people that wanted me to do something, uh, like County Commissioner Reginald Milton, he paid me six because he wanted me to deal with the fact that Janine Gordon was not a footy law. You want special stuff added, you pay for the special stuff. And yes, Reginald Milton paid me $6,000. It ain't no secret. Uh, if you pull the campaign disclosures, 
it's going to be there. You know, so he paid for what he wanted. If you want me to target, then you pay for that. Okay? You pay for that. And that's exactly what it is. Uh, let me tell you something. I make the best commercials. I script all of these commercials. I produced all of these commercials. You politicians who are out there and you still need some advertising, you know how to call me. You know how to get in touch with me. I got you. You someone ask me the question, just text me. Am I supporting Amy Warren? Yes, I am. Has she advertised? Not as of yet. If she does, I'm going to take her advertising down. I ain't going to try to go up on the price on her or anybody else. It is what it is. I'm a businessman. Okay? I am a business man. That's what I'm here to do. But it pisses me off to have to deal with folks that fuck with my money. We ain't friends. We ain't never been friends. We were associates. You was my associate because you talk too much. Always got something to say about everything. The one, yeah, he been talking about you. Oh, and I can't think of this other lady's name. I've been known her all my life. Beautician down there. Oh, what's the name? I can't think of a name. Yeah. This ain't personal. This is business. I know no motherfuckers that popping no damn firecrackers. Oh, you motherfuckers got my nerve with that shit yesterday. I don't even know why you celebrate the 4th of July. You Negroes wasn't free. Most of y'all ain't free or now. Okay. Hey, Cookie Drake. How you doing, baby? Okay. But Wonder Havoc will be my guest on tomorrow night. You know, I have no disrespect for Baba Cooper. But 93 is time to set the house, rock, and Sat down on the post with a beer. You know. Uh, that's what you do. Okay. That's what you do. San, Sanji Maymula. <laughs> Y'all know I had to I had to work on that name. I had to cut that commercial two or three times of the Sanji Maymula. Well, I got it down. Y'all hear the firecrackers? Motherfucker shooting firecrackers this time of night. It's not Teddy, baby. It's Teddy Bear. It ain't, it ain't Teddy Bear. I'm probably soft and cuddly like a Teddy Bear, baby. But it's, I'm the Teddy Bear. Okay? All right. Well... We did what we can do for this night. I think I did a great interview, a very professional interview with the uh, District Attorney General. And people will say, well, she came on your show because she ran for office. Whatever reason, she came on my show. Okay. All right, what time is it? Five minutes before the hour of nine o'clock. All right, I'm finna go. Yes, I'm very professional. Y'all think I could be professional? Damn. No, I didn't even cuss once. 
I know how to do this shit. The cussing is entertainment. That makes you motherfuckers come to see who I'm going to cuss out. I'm going to probably get a chance to cuss somebody out on tomorrow. So you stay tuned and you be here with me. Okay. So the temperature hit triple digits today. Shit, I stayed in the car. I pulled in and just walked on in somewhere. <laughs> Cookies. So you need to be good, girl. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Did you were you all informed about a lot of things that you may not have known about the district attorney general's office? Um a lot of things that you were blaming the district attorney general's office is the legislators. Okay. Um, so that's when I when I hear Stevie Moroy talking about what he gonna do for black folk. What you gonna do for the people, not just black people. What are you going to do for people? What are you going to do for people that violate the law? Okay. All right, that's what it's all about. Join me on the radio, 6 a.m. Those of you outside of my listening area of the radio stations, um, just go to WAGR or on the TuneIn app. W-A-G-R on the TuneIn app. And uh, you'll get me from 6 until 10 o'clock in the morning with the Bets and Blues and Southern Soul. Until then, y'all, hasta mañana, sarinata, or just plain old.